Ahmedabad, India. The only way these women can make a living is by recycling. Every day, 30,000 women comb the streets and garbage dumps to scrape a living. A world away from billions of dollars promised by the G20 governments for green investment, there have always been recycling jobs. But in the so-called informal sector, they tend to be for the poorest people. You can be a green job on a rubbish dump where you are polluted by heavy metals because you have to collect rubbish without any protection, but you're actually part of the recycling economy. That is not a decent job, even though it is a green job. If we didn't exist, this city would be covered in rubbish. People don't appreciate our function. At least it's work, but of course we'd rather do something else. According to the International Labour Organization, 1.6 billion of the world's workers do not have real jobs at all, making ends meet however they can. They don't consider us as part of society. We're banned from entering certain places. They call us thieves. There's no respect for us. Our work is not valued. What hope do the new green stimulus measures have for people like these? Green jobs have to be good jobs. You just can't leave it to the market. The market always looks for the cheapest solution. It might be green, but it's not decent. India is home to one of the largest wind turbine manufacturers in the world, employing 13,000 people. In New Delhi, the introduction of natural gas buses is expected to create 18,000 new jobs, a token perhaps in a country that has a labour force of over 500 million. We assess the promise of a green global economy to create new growth and new jobs. In India, the Self-Employed Women's Association, SEWA, has brought together over a million women toiling in the informal sector and is already putting into practice each and every element of a sustainable economy without any help from the government. Poor are the most green because they have to innovate coping strategies day in and day out for their survival from whatever meager resources that are available within their own little surrounding. And therefore I think they have the best of the strategies for green livelihoods. A few of SEWA's members have been able to find better work from recycled waste. Publishers of books and magazines and even some textile companies have been buying the products, an opportunity for slightly higher pay and better working conditions. SEWA is hoping to lead by example. In rural areas, some of the poorest in India, SEWA has introduced biogas stoves, the change has been dramatic. Before I had the biogas stove, we had to wake up every morning at 5 and go and collect firewood and not come back till 1 or 1.30 to make food. During that time, the children would go hungry and couldn't study and I couldn't take care of them properly. The stoves use cow manure to create gas, allowing Canterben to save hours every day. Canterben Thakur is 27 years old a mother of three living in the district of Patan in central Gujarat. Her husband leaves for long periods each year to find work, leaving her alone to tend the small plot of land they use to grow cotton. She now uses the slurry from the biogas stove as an organic fertiliser. The compost fertiliser is very good for degraded land. Now we get 70 to 80 tonnes of cotton, before we hardly got 20 tonnes per year. The lives of the uh, rural women workers very much depend on the environment for water, for fuel wood, for fodder. Environmental regeneration plays a very major role in our union, but it also leads to economic regeneration. We believe in the Gandhian ideology of building self-reliant local economies. 125,000 small farmers now market their products under Sewa's Rudy label. These are sold by a task force of over 2,500 local women, helping them to earn a decent living. It generates employment at each and every stage in the supply chain, and that's how the economy thrives, and people also have work security and income security. 
Even in the most extreme conditions, the desert salt mines of northern Gujarat, the Sewa Women's Association is finding green solutions. For six months of the year, Ansuya Ramish Bai migrates from her village to join the thousands that work the salt mines in the Ran Desert, leaving her two eldest children in the care of relatives. Every season the traders and the middlemen exploited us because they paid what they wanted and we had no way of knowing the price of salt in the city. But now we've doubled our money and secured better and more stable prices. The change was possible thanks to the introduction of solar panels, which Sewa members pay off in small instalments. Energy means that mobile phones can be charged, and the miners can now stay in touch with their families and with the latest market prices. Now we are thinking that if we had solar energy for the water pumps we use in salt mining, then we could save a lot of money that we now spend on diesel. Sewa has taken up Ansuya's suggestion, hiring engineers to develop solar-powered water pumps used to bring the briny water to the surface. <laughs> Dakar, the capital of Bangladesh, a city of over 20 million people locked in a constant traffic jam. Add to this more than 1,000 brick kilns that surround the city, and the result is one of the most polluted environments on Earth. Bangladesh is also extremely poor. Its main source of employment is garment factories, where women earn less than a dollar a day making clothes for export. It is also a low-lying country, where floods and extreme weather events resulting from climate change have drastic consequences. I think uh, Bangladesh, every scientist, they always come up with a conclusion. Bangladesh, one of the big team of global warming, first big team, the number one vulnerable, risky country. If anything happen, then the one meter water rise, the one third of the country will be under water, uh, millions of people will be displaced. So this is a hazard, uh, people are talking about it. Driving at night in rural Bangladesh, it is hard to believe this is a country of over 140 million people. Over 70% of the country is not connected to the national power grid. Meet Ambia Khatun. 30 years old, mother of two, and one of Bangladesh's 100 million rural poor. A year ago, her husband left her to fend for herself and her sons without a job, without land, and without much hope. My life was terrible. When my husband left, my life was very unstable, but then I bought a solar panel and battery, and it changed my life. It was beyond my imagination and my dreams. In 1996, Grameen Shakti, a subsidiary of the Grameen Bank, decided to promote renewable energy in the shape of simple solar panels as an energy solution for millions of Bangladeshis. So we created a, a product called Solar Home System, an external system that we designed in such a way they can save money from kerosene, they can pay monthly installment. So it's now is much more economically viable. At the cost of corrosion, you can buy a solar home system. From garment workers earning less than a dollar a day to engineers in renewable energy. Initially, Grameen Shakti set up 20 technology centers around the country where village women were trained to install and service solar home systems, betting there would be an explosion in demand. Through the training, we are changing our lives. In Bangladesh, women are treated as less important than men, less able to make money. There are many women who have been abandoned or divorced. Becoming an engineer and training in solar energy restores some of our dignity. Ambia is one of the training center's star pupils. Her home is now an efficient assembly line where she makes cell phone chargers, solar lamps and AC-DC converters that she can sell to other solar panel users in her community. Now I can stay at home and take care of my children. I'm making 7,000 taka, but when the children grow up and I have more time, I'll be able to make twice that. Now that his wife is making four times the wage of a garment worker in the city, it's perhaps not surprising that Ambia's husband has returned. Once a week, Ambia takes her assembled products to the nearest technology centre, where they are sold to new users. 
Women are victim of poverty, women are victim of energy also. In the household, they are running the household economy. So you need electricity, you need energy in the household. You need uh, energy for cooking, you need a light for reading, you need a light for working. So that women is a victim of uh, energy and poverty also. So in that case, we see, in Gamin Bank, we see women is the driving force of the whole institution. In 1996, Grameen Shakti installed 10,000 solar panels in one year. Today they are installing 10,000 panels every month. They have 2 million solar panels installed and are hoping to have 75 million by 2015. We are creating green jobs in the rural area to install the system, to maintain the system producing the accessories. At the same time, we are creating an extension of working hours. Every solar home system in the marketplaces, they are using for the business. Number three, also we are provide the poor women, we train them and they become entrepreneurs. So the social aspect is also addressed, environment aspect also addressed, and also economic aspect also addressed. So we win situation that we can create a green energy, a green economy, and green jobs we are doing. In Washington, D.C., Akim Steiner is on a whirlwind tour from the White House to the United Nations Foundation to convince the world that investing in green can truly jumpstart the global economy. We must also ensure that these investments create jobs for our children, otherwise they'll be paying for our jobs that we're keeping today at the expense of their own future, and that is simply not an acceptable choice. Cleaning the environment and securing a sustainable future for the planet can create millions of green jobs. To make it a reality, people like Steiner argue for the need to create an alliance, a union of green that helps us realise we are all in this together. It represents, if you want, a reflection of the realities of so many different people, communities, societies across the world. It has brought into an alliance two forces two views of the world, two realities of being a human being on this planet that belong together, should have been together far earlier and certainly will shape, I think, in many ways, the future path of our economies and our societies.